Welcome to the Saramone Valley Democratic Club. My name is Brody Help. I serve as president. I'm here with Rick Adler, our vice president, and board member Cecilia Manalga. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. I wanted to alert you to the fact that the Saramone Valley Democratic Club will be electing officers at our May meeting. So please consider running for president, vice president, secretary, or treasurer. You can um, send me an email if, you, if you're interested in that position. And in particular, we have a, a need for someone to run as treasurer. Our current treasurer is stepping down after eight years of wonderful service. Um, thank you, Brian Lover. This is a Zoom meeting, so I cannot present you your award in, in person, but our club is presenting this award to you for your eight years of service. Thank you so much, Brian. You've been a very important elected officer of our club. Thank you so much. <laughs> And if you're interested in running for position of the club, please send an email to president at srvdems.org. And tonight we have two wonderful speakers, our very own Congressman Mark DeSonye, who will update us about our district and about what has been happening in DC. And then uh, please stay for our second speaker, Dr. Michael Baker, a retired Admiral in the Navy. He has recently served as a surgeon in Ukraine, and we will hear about his experiences. Um, how appropriate it is that we're having this meeting when just two days ago, we recognized the anniversary of the war of Ukraine. Okay, um, so first we're honored to have our Congressman, Mark DeSonia, he's been our Congressman since 2015, but you may not know much about him because he's pretty low key, but he's one of the few members of Congress to serve on four committees. He currently sits on the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, the Committee on Education and Labor, where he serves as Chairman of Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions. He is also a, on, and he serves on the Committee on Oversight and Reform, and he's also a member of the House Committee on Rules. Um, and here's some insight into Mark, who's on the Progressive Caucus. Here's what the Progressive Caucus has to say about Mark. The Sonia co-sponsors all the big ticket progressive priorities, but he also backs less well-known policies, such as raising the estate tax to 77%. We'll ask him about that. <laughs> and requiring corporations to give a one third of their board seats to workers. Sonia refrains from shouting his left-wing resume from the rooftop, opting to instead to come across in public as a mild-mannered liberal Democrat. And talking to politicians, usually when we talk to uh, politicians about backing our progressive values, they want to know, well, are you going to fund our campaign? But as this, caucus, as this caucus says, every once in a while, you get a gem like Mark Sonia who owes progressives nothing but goes to bat for them every day. Mark, we at Saramone Valley Democratic Club value your work in DC and we value your being able to speak to us tonight. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Brody. I'm just mild-mannered Mark. <laughs> um, well, I, I love that uh, that article with something. Um, so just uh, I'll give you a little breakdown of that bio. We've got to get you a newer one just because those four committees I was on while we were in the majority. Uh, now that we're in the minority, unfortunately, um, I had some movement. I was on the oversight committee for the first eight years. Uh, I am not on there any longer. Um, uh, and rules. Um, I'm not on, but I'm sort of the alternate. So we only have, there are nine members of the majority party on rules um, and four in the minority. So um, I was elected vice chair of that when I was on it and I'm looking forward to going back. Uh, it's a lot of work, but it allows you to weigh in on every piece of legislation um, irrespective of what your committee assignments are because every bill gets marked up um, in the committee of jurisdiction and then has to come to rules before it goes to the floor. Uh, when the country was started, it was called the speaker's committee because uh, the speaker actually chaired it. Um, in the California legislature in the Senate, the, the pro tem um, 
this, uh, of the Senate, Speaker Pro Tem, who is the leader, uh, actually chairs that meeting. So a lot of legislative history there. I am on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee still and the Education and Labor Committee. I am no longer, because we are no longer in the majority, chair of the Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions Subcommittee. I am the ranking member. Um, and I love the committee. Uh, for those of you who um, like organizational aspects of the, of the Congress, my uh, counterpart in the Senate is Bernie Sanders, but he's chair because they we have the majority there. Um, and then uh, I did pick up a third committee, um, uh, the new leader, um, Hakeem Jeffries, a, a very good friend, even though he's a Yankees fan, and I am a diehard Giants and Red Sox fan, uh, asked me to go on the ethics committee, which, as you can imagine, um, when you read about what's happening back there with some of our, call, our members, uh, particularly Republican members, uh, one notable one that I'm not allowed to talk about uh, as a member of the committee. It's it's uh, five Republicans, five Democrats, the only committee that's consistently equal. Uh, and we, we do investigations around ethical behavior and also um, oversee what the best practices are to make sure that members uh, are aware of their ethical responsibilities in their job. So um, I'm thrilled to have those. Uh, one big bill that I was able to get out of the house that I put a lot of work into um, our, is the Mental Health Matters Act. We're gonna do it again. I'm working with the Republicans. Uh, we did have uh, one Republican vote for that um, when it got off the house floor and we're gonna keep working on it. It's an issue for me personally and professionally. Um, and it's something that I, particularly when it comes to kids, as the Educational Labor Committee, there's a lot of work we're doing around that. Um, and we'll continue to, and we hope for more uh, bipartisan efforts. On, um, the on the transportation fund, let's just briefly go through what we accomplished the last two years uh, as the last two years of Speaker Pelosi's incredible um, service to this country. It was, so first, uh, the bailout uh, the multiple bills that were bipartisan to help us get through COVID. Um, I just did a presentation at the Tri-Valley Mayor's Conference last night on who got what um, within the Valley. Uh, as part of that, it's in the millions of dollars. Uh, it went through the state and then was distributed to the local government. And then we had a, a part of that uh, that I played a, a significant role in, in helping small business. Um, since I was a small business owner, uh, for many, many years, um, trying to make sure that people could keep their employee employees um, on their payroll and continue to work. And I work closely with the restaurant industry, had a number of meetings with people in our district, uh, the owners of Metro is one of my favorite restaurants, a wonderful restaurant in Lafayette. Um, the two owners there, mom and pop, literally, um, we worked with and they helped organize people so that I could do feedback. So that was very successful. I don't think the administration, uh, President Biden, and we get enough credit for how that protected people's lives um, and dropped the level of hospitalizations um, on the health side and also helped keep people employed and businesses going. Um, then and the, one of the really big things I was very involved with is the infrastructure bill. This is the largest uh, investment in Americans infrastructure since the Eisenhower administration. A uh, key part of that was a bill that I authored called the Clean Quarters Act. It was a priority for both the administration and for our committee, um, the Transportation Committee, uh, when we were in the majority. Uh, that created a grant program that I started with a billion dollars. It's been accelerated to uh, in the multiple billion dollars to provide infrastructure for the clean energy economy. Uh, we're, we're, the car companies are moving um, to battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell cars rapidly. Uh, we have to provide that infrastructure. In the Bay Area, I've had this conversation with Secretary Buttigieg. I um, questioned him about this at one of the hearings he, he testified to and have developed a wonderful relationship with Mayor Pete, Secretary Pete, really bright, wonderful. Uh, talk about a deep bench for us. Uh, he's right there on that bench. Um, so we, we talked about um, colleagues from the South are saying, this is a waste of money. We should stick with fossil fuels. And my, my public, uh, including a member from Louisiana who I serve with, um, 
I just said, fine, if you don't want to come along, California is already going in that direction, you'll be left behind. Um, and so the, the idea of that is, and working closely with our transportation agencies and MTC here in the Bay Area, we're going to be very aggressive of providing that infrastructure, making sure it's as a zero uh, CO2 and carbon from what we refer to as well to the wheel, so renewables, wind and solar, which we lead in the, in the East Bay in many ways, but getting the distribution center uh, system together. Just in context, um, my Republican colleagues will say, oh, it's going to take years to do this. Uh, and my response is the Chinese are adding 100,000 charging stations a month. Uh, we have about 300,000 in the whole country, and we're adding about 20,000 a month. Uh, so the Chinese are all in on changing their economy off of fossil fuels. Some of it's for their own interest uh, because they have many of the min minerals in abundance um, to build these renewables. We are, we do too. Uh, that's one of the arguments against it. We just, we know that salt and sea has a lot of the minerals, but we have to develop the process for extracting them and be environmental sense sensitive. So anyways, I can answer questions about that, but I know I don't, there's a lot I want to talk about. The infrastructure bill, um, is over a trillion dollars. Half of that is coming from the federal government. When I started in politics, the methodology, the ratio for funding for infrastructure was 75% federal, 25% state and local. That has flipped in the 30 years with Republicans eating away at infrastructure and deferring our investment. Um, so with this, it'll start to bring it back to where it used to be. Um, instead of where it is now, which is 75% in the Bay Area and California, local and state, 25% federal. This will change that uh, and have the federal government back to where it's supposed to be. So it's not just roads, streets, and transit, but it's water quality, uh, sewer, everything that we need for infrastructure. All of these jobs will create generations of Davis-Bacon uh, labor jobs so, and we're working with um, the League of Conservation Voters and the Building Trades in California and with Secretary Walsh, Granholm, um, and the EPA Secretary to have a pathway where we identify the jobs in the green economy, what their wages and compensation will be, um, and NOAA as well, because they have a lot of these funds. So we'll see generations of good paying jobs uh, for Americans who are getting union wages and benefits to implement this. So that's really exciting um, and I'm very grateful for it. I think we should really be shouting this from the rooftops. Multiple presidents tried to do this and Biden was successful with Speaker Pelosi and Leader uh, Schumer. It's really, really significant for our economy and the way it's rolled out. The um, bill, what I refer to as Build Back Better or Build Back Light after we couldn't get the votes from Senator Sinema and Manchin in, um, Reconciliation of the Senate for Build Back Big. Um, it was also called uh, technically the Inflation Reduction Act. Also very exciting. Uh, $400 billion uh, for uh, green energy transition. It's the biggest investment uh, in the history of the Western, um, in, the, in the United States, I should say, one of the biggest in terms of total size uh, in the developed world. Uh, only China rivals it. And this is going to help transition our economy um, to both an environmentally sound, but also an economically strong economy. So those three things I think we really need to shout from the mountaintop. In that last bill, uh, lastly, we started to finally do something about prescription drugs. Um, and I put a lot of effort into it. I was part of the rollout of this, some of the hearings, because of I'm a survivor of cancer. I am kept alive by um, a drug that was mostly developed at the American Cancer Institute, but Johnson & Johnson took it over. They were charging Americans who had my um, lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, it's the most common form of blood cancer. 20 years ago, it was deadly. I was stage four when I was diagnosed 10 years ago. This, this drug, $500 a day to keep me alive in the United States. In Australia, it was $37. In the EU, it was $90, even though American taxpayers paid for most of the base research. So we had the CEO of Johnson & Johnson come in, uh, not a very nice person. I was able to, on the oversight committee, question him and said, you are subsidizing, you are making American taxpayers and consumers subsidize 
the rest of the world. So we've got the price down on that drug to about $90 a pill, $400 improvement, but we need to do more. And um, particularly, so in the, in the Inflation Reduction Act, Build Back Light, uh, we also got provisions that are going to cap dialysis, um, which is a big abuse. We've had hearings about that. So that's really exciting. Um, really excited about my new district. Um, I'll miss my old district. The old district went from Richmond to downtown Antioch um, with part of Martinez. And then I, I, the coast was up in Mike Thompson's district, Rodeo and Pacheco. Uh, and then I went down to the Danville border. The commission moved me east. So I've got all of Eastern Contra Costa now. Uh, and then I go down into Dublin. Um, so I have the valley. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, spent a lot of time just uh, we started an education listening tour. I've done this multiple times and we focused on the new parts of the district. It's been spectacular, um, really fun uh, being out there. Um, and then community benefits projects, we're going to keep those. Uh, the ranking of the chair of the appropriations committees, uh, Representative Granger has said the Republicans are gonna keep those. We're waiting to see the guidelines. I was wildly successful in those. We were in the Bay Area, uh, but mostly it's because of the partnerships um, with particularly our mental health, our, our education community and our transportation community. And one bill I'm really proud of, uh, the Contra Costa Community College will get a million dollars uh, for open textbooks so they can use technology. Um, this has a multiplier many times. It's one of the biggest obstacles along with housing uh, for young people getting their AA. So I've been working closely with them. So with that, I will stop and answer any questions. I'm thrilled to, um, again, get to work with you and represent you. And I'm really excited. I mean, we the other big success was political. We were, all the pundits said we were gonna lose 40, 50 seats um, and we didn't. We were within five seats of the majority. Uh, we should be able to add to that and get back in the majority in two years. And we've got to reelect President Biden and uh, add to the seats in the majority in the Senate, that's gonna be harder to do. Um, but all of those things, we're in very wonderful times for progressive Democrats, but we've gotta keep delivering and make, make sure Americans understand how we're working for average working Americans. So I'll end there, happy to answer any questions. Thanks again for having me on. That sounds wonderful. Thank you for everything that, you know, for telling us all these wonderful things that are happening that, you know, we may not know about in the, in the Inflation Reduction Act. So open up to questions. And we have one from Ellis and Sharon. Ellis, Ellis, show me your hat. <laughs> there you go. I want you to, I want you to see my progressive caucus. Ooh, I like that. Cool. That's from uh, New York. Uh, I want to thank you. Somebody in your office, Aaron Sanchez, Aaron Sanchez helped us get through a social security debacle. I spoke to him today. He called me up to follow up and um, he really got me through the woods. And I, I want to thank you and compliment him. I said I was going to talk to his boss today. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. And, and thank you for everything you do, Mark. But yes. Thanks. That Ellis. is particular. We have thank to you. get you down to our club yeah. for them to meet you. Yeah. Anyway. You know, you, that just, I really appreciate it. I'll tell Aaron that he's our newest hire. Um, one of the things that's most rewarding to me, sometimes people ask me why I keep doing my job given how dysfunctional Congress is, is the retail aspect of helping people call the office. When you call our office, somebody will answer the phone. I, I, and we get comments all the time about that. I've always done this. I think it's because of my retail experience, but the most joy I get from this job is hearing things like that. We have a wonderful team, Chanel, our great district director, and uh, Betsy, our chief of staff. We've been acknowledged by the Congressional Foundation, Management Foundation twice. No other office in Congress has been recognized for our constituent services. And I'm very, very proud of it. They only recognize uh, one Senate office and one House office every year. 
in three different categories. And we're the only one that's been recognized twice. And it's mostly because of the great work that Chanel and Betsy and our team do. So thank you for telling me that. I love it. Hey, There's nothing uh, better than uh, having a constituent come up to you. Know, too. <laughs> yeah, it's nothing better than having a constituent come up to you and tell you that we helped, we saved their social security or something like that. And I'll just briefly say, I spent five hours trying to get my, um, my license renewed. Uh, <laughs> today and, today, and I'm planning on talking to the governor about my experience. I was denied. Um, and they <laughs> denied was denied. I thought it was a Trump plot, but you'll love this. After five hours of waiting, go and I had a two o'clock appointment at Concord DMV. And after two and a half hours, I was sent home and they said, you got to call this number in Sacramento. I, I called four different numbers and finally I found out, listen to this. I'm not sure I should even tell you this until I tell my state reps. They finally told me in the investigatory unit that it was probably because DMV's technology regularly can identify a US passport issued by the State Department, which is what their preferred proof of identification is. That if you got one over after uh, 2018, after that, about 95% of them don't work in the system. So I have to wait and hope that somebody will realize I am who I am. <laughs> Sorry to digress, but it's like, okay. <laughs> you're just like us. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're yeah like I, I, was, I was sitting on the floor at Concord DMV and somebody recognized me, came over and said, don't you get VIP treatment? And I said, no, apparently this is it. <laughs> I think it was a Republican, he was quite happy. <laughs> oh, no. Hey Brody, there was a there was a question from Stuart Winter that was it's been in uh, chat for a little while. Oh, okay. I can I can read it. Oh, it's okay. it says um, I read in today's New York Times that a lot of clean energy projects are being delayed or canceled because of the slow pace of connecting clean generation to the grid. Do you have any thoughts on how this can be resolved? Yeah, I saw that. I, I saw that article. Um, that's why. The, the bill I talked about, the clean quarter bill, and because, you know, I was appointed, I don't know how long ago, 1994, I think, to the Air Resources Board in California, um, served under three different governors. Uh, Nancy, or Speaker Pelosi, was nice enough to tell people in the Congress that I was an expert on this. Um, we know that we don't have the infrastructure, so the New York Times article is accurate. It's one of our challenges. My argument is that that's why these two bills, the infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act with its $400 billion uh, of money that will all be uh, leveraged for more private and local and state funds, that's what we're in the race for is deploying that. So we wanna get that from the well to the wheel is zero carbon and zero regular pollutants is regular and we can do it, uh, but it's gonna take a lot of work. So the article was accurate, but we're working on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Charles Hottinger. Yes, uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, as far as the green energy is concerned, you know, the sun doesn't shine all the time. And sometimes we end up with a surplus of uh, solar generated uh, power. Have there been any uh, actual moves to investigate or build pumped hydro projects? You know, what? Yes, there's a lot of research. Actually, it's in our neighborhood. Uh, Lawrence Livermore and Berkeley do, is doing a lot on storage. So this is a problem with, with renewables. Uh, you got to be able to deliver it at all times of the day and night. Um, so there's this is a, a, an admitted challenge, um, but we believe and the research community believes, including the Europeans and the Chinese, that the technology is there to develop uh, storage both in the long term and the short term. So moving all these parts together is um, it's not a done deal. We've got to put more money and work into it. But you're absolutely right. That and the previous questions are two of our biggest challenges. Uh, some of our other challenges were range anxiety, and we're starting to cure those um, with battery technology that takes you longer on fast chargers. This mm -hmm. is a you know this is a huge thing. Um, uh, David Jurgen has got a great book. It's called uh, The New Map. I believe it is, and it talks about Ukraine just as the war was leading up to it and how energy, you know, David Jurgen wrote the prize, uh, Commanding Heights. He's an expert on energy, historical energy. So you think of when 
civilizations develop different energy sources, those are transformative times. Um, so this is probably the biggest transformation on energy and the most efficient one, but we've, it's a big challenge. That sounds yeah, well, the pumped, the pumped hydro, I was thinking, is not particularly high tech. Like one proposal would be to uh, build a, another another dam and reservoir below uh, Hoover Dam, and then uh, when the water comes out, you, uh, you use it at night, and during the day, you use surplus uh, uh, solar power to pump it back up into Lake Mead. That's not very high tech, I realize, but uh, would seem to have some. You know, when we when we did the renewable portfolio standard in California, uh, then Senator Smitty and now supervisor in Santa Clara, uh, Alex Padilla, myself, uh, I chair the transportation committee. Alex chaired the energy committee. We didn't include hydro because we wanted the purest of the pure, and we also have challenges that we're now seeing, although it's raining right now about hydro in California, but I, I agree with you. So it's not at the gold standard, but it's also easier to reach than the gold standard. So it's gotta be in our portfolio. Okay, good. Thank you. And what was, who was the author of that book you, you mentioned, the new map? David Jurgen. Uh, he okay. is a Pulitzer Prize winning for the prize. It's a history of fossil fuels. Okay. Uh, the new map is his latest book and it just talks about the U Ukraine, why it's so important. Um, in the transition. So it's about Putin's ego and geopolitical, but it's also about how we transport fossil fuels from um, the Middle East and also from Russia in particular to um, the EU. So you've got Nord Stream, then you've got the older pipeline in Northern Europe, and then you go across Ukraine. Um, and that's part of what the fight is about. Um, so that's what he writes about the new map is how maps in history have been dependent on um, your access to fossil fuel in the last 150 years. Thank you. Uh, Ray Mariella. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Brody. Um, I, I have a question, Mark, that uh, a question whether I've been getting clickbait a lot in my emails, but what was there any chance that when we controlled the, the house, that we could have made the District of Columbia the 51st state. I see it discussed a lot. And was that, is that just something to raise funds or was there something behind it? No, we had multiple long hearings at the time I was on the oversight committee. Uh, Eleanor Norton, who represents the district attorney, a wonderful historic uh, member, one of the first African-Americans in the, in the house um, and from DC. She's been great at this, uh, but we can't get the votes in the Senate. So we've okay. had some success in the House, but we can't get the votes in the Senate. Oh, and so. Republicans aren't going to vote to give no, no. The Senate two, two votes for the District of Columbia. You know, Wyoming has two votes, and it's half the size of Contra Costa. Um, okay. So it's, we're going to keep working on it, but it's, um, it's part of our heritage left over from slavery and Reconstruction and the founding of this country. But, but I guess what I'm saying is if, if we have 51 senators, including a couple of flaky ones, is that not enough? In other words, would they vote against it? Yes, because you okay. need a filibuster in this instance. Ah, okay, thank you. Okay. You, you, we, we've done the budget stuff on reconciliation and that the constitution and the parliamentarians let us do that because it's purely budgetary, but we can't legislate by the parliamentarian's definition in those bills. And obviously creating two new two Senate seats and a voting House seat would require change um, to our rules in the, and um, it would be legislated. We think we can do it without a constitutional amendment. The Republicans would, would sue on that and given the makeup of the Supreme Court right now, probably win. Mm. Mm, thank you. Um, Arlene Reed. Hi, Mark. I, like all of us, are so appreciative of you. Aww. And we are so glad you are our congressman. Wow. Anyway, you know, I just really support what you have talked about today. Uh, you know, the climate work, the infrastructure, um, the build back better light, all that stuff. Um, I also appreciate it, your vote recent on the um, 
Palestinian or Israeli issue, and also your vote on that HR. Oh my goodness, HR one con. I don't know. You know what it, <laughs> the horrors of socialism voted no. Um, I I appreciate too that you checked my emails on Nicaragua. And I'm wondering a question if you have been able to read my most recent e emails regarding the 222 prisoners that were flown to the US and got here February 9th. And I have been seeing uh, news on them on the media. And it's so, it, it is really a lot of dis information. Shamara and that Felix guy, can't remember his last name. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were both involved in the U.S. supported 2018 coup. So I'm wondering, do you also deal in the Congress? Well, I don't know if you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, do you read them? And are you able to express anything in the House? Yes. So um, I did have more of a role when I was on oversight because I was on the sub subcommittee with Stephen Lynch, wonderful friend from Boston, was the chair when we were in charge of um, national security, which include immigration. Most of that jurisdiction is in the Homeland Security Committee. Um, so, but I get, you know, a member of Congress, I've been to the border, I've sat, I mean, the experiences of sitting with people um, who are being detained, families, um, it's just awful. I was down there when Trump started a zero tolerance thing and a five-year-old kid from Nicaragua sat next to me in a very large shelter by Catholic Charities. Um, they had taken him, the border patrol, put him in a plane as a five-year-old, separated him from his father, sent him to Atlanta. Um, obviously this young person didn't speak English. Um, so then because we were there, we put pressure on them. Uh, he was with me and um, a representative Jayapal, a group of us were down there, um, the, who's the chair of the Progressive Caucus. And it's just awful, you know, his dad's there and they had applied for asylum. It's completely, it's, it's stated, the law of the United States in our treaties that we would accept them. So that still goes on um, and we've got to just keep working at it. I'm but, not you know, really, I'm not really talking about uh, Nicaraguans coming to the border because as you no, probably know, I'm talking about the disinformation in the US, including by Biden, about the, situ the current situation in Nicaragua which it they it is a democratic country and they have more social programs that maybe the US doesn't like because they think it's socialism. Okay, I'll quit, but I just well, no, want I mean, to make you, sure I'm clear. You send me clear. the information because yeah, this, this I must admit you. that's not the information I get talking to including colleagues, uh, Norma Torres, who I served with the legislature and is from Nicaragua. So I, I would like to go to Nicaragua. It is a democracy, but what I get and what the intelligence reports I get is there's a lot of corruption in Nicaragua. Okay. In this. So. Well, I'm glad I'll I'll send it. It to him. I'm just, you know, trying to get as many questions. This is not a time for people to talk about their issues. So thank you. And I'm hopefully you can, um, thank you, Mark, for your comments on that. Um, J Judy Finch. Uh, okay. Uh, first, I just want to thank you for all your hard work. And uh, you, we're all must are so proud of you. <laughs> and and I have a question uh, to ask if, if you know of any uh, uh, forthcoming bills dealing with uh, the super PACs and any other effects of, of uh, Citizens United. Wow. Well, um, HR1, which I worked on closely with a very dear friend, John Sarbanes from Maryland, uh, he put so much work into this. Um, and I, I don't see it as long as we are not in the majority. Mm -hmm. uh, we got that out of the house with a lot of heavy lifting from a lot of us, particular 
particularly John and Speaker Pelosi, but we couldn't get any kind of traction in the Senate. Um, it would require 60 votes to get a hearing in the Senate. Uh, I thought one of the strategies was for the majority in the Senate to uh, do what they've done on Supreme Court nominees. People will argue whether that was a good move or not, um, that you would drop the threshold for something like this. We have to change it. Citizens United is ruining this country. Uh, the, the, you know, I've done town halls on this, so I won't go into the details. But the political co consulting class and independent expenditures, primarily the Koch brothers who orchestrated it and the far right, are ruining this country. And I, now we have to fight a lot of the Democrats do the same thing. It's unaccountable. Talk about disinformation. I mean, yeah. it's always been thus in politics since, uh, who is it, Calendar, uh, at the beginning of the country when Adams ran against Jefferson. But yeah. it's just awful right now. And um, we will keep fighting for it, but it's the biggest antidote to our problems in democracy yeah. is HR1, at least would allow for transparency so people could find out who's behind the funding and then make their own decision. You sometimes okay. feel you're in survival survival mode? Frequently, but I've survived. I've survived more dangerous things. Yeah, congratulations. My, my kids gave me the Superman poster to mock me. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, I can remember when we were all working for HR1, you know, for campaign finance reform. And yeah, so we'll bring it back in a couple of years, hopefully. <laughs> um, yeah. Frank Burton. You're on mute, Frank. Frank, can you unmute? Okay, now can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, Mark, you've been one of my favorite congressmen for years and years, even though I've never been one of your constituents. <laughs> You're just, just so active and, and so progressive and so forth. Uh, the question has to do mm -hmm. with uh, community choice aggregation. I know that's primarily a state thing, but I'm wondering if there's anything that you can be doing that encourages community choice aggregation. Yes. So a lot of these bills that we talked about, about transition is in the distribution is who governs that, who controls it. Uh, so I think the utility industry should change dramatically, particularly us who have to deal with PG&E, who's, yes. don't get me started. Um, yes. so right. to, there is opportunity for that. I was proud in the legislature to, along with, um, Alex Padilla, but in particular, allowing the legislation for Contra Costa to join Marin, um, which now Alameda then followed us. So mm -hmm. the distributed generation is an important part of all that infrastructure. And we'll have to keep doing incentives um, in federal legislation to get people to have that choice and to change uh, the utilities roles. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, can, can I be on your uh, email list, even though I'm not one of your constituents? Um, well, where do you live? Uh, I live in Rio Vista in Solano County. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you can be on the political one. Um, so s just send us an email, and um, you can send that to the the political just to Sonia for Congress, uh, and we'll put you on that one. Um, no I, I am um, constrained by House rules about how I use public dollars outside of my district. Okay. Thank you. Which we all we all are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jillian Elliott. Hi, Mark. Hey, I know you. I know, it's so good to see you. It's especially good to see you smiling. Uh, um, I, first of all, I wanna thank Chanel um, and you, um, but Chanel uh, was really, really helpful when the, um, the toxic leak happened on Thanksgiving. And I understand that, um, that you sent a letter. Um, and just to update, uh, Yesterday, the the county health department um, told people that they shouldn't eat anything that's grown in their garden and they shouldn't plant this year because of the heavy metals and toxins mm -hmm. in the soil. But it it really brought up for people in our area um, what industry and what toxicity can do to us. And then after what happened in Ohio, I'm wondering, is there any appetite at all? I know the the Republicans are running from the fact that what happened in Ohio is probably at least partially due to rolling back regulations during the Trump administration. But is there any appetite for strengthening protections 
um, regarding toxins. You know, we're at a thoroughfare with um, with trains and bringing um, things to and from refineries and chemicals. And I think a lot of I talk to people every day who are really concerned about this. Okay, so this is the release at the old Shell refinery. Still in yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's the release of that, but it's also bigger. It's like let's start. Let's start with that. Okay. Then, um, California is not preempted to go, from going further under the Clean Air Act. So the Bay Area has been a leader at this. So I'll take some credit for this. When I was on the Bay Area Air District, it should be. Um, so you should be talking to them. I had a meeting with them, and I'll just tell you the history of that plant. When Shell was there, they were the highest performing of all the refineries. Um, in terms of their in, environmental stewardship, uh, largely in my view, because they were, they were although the, the company is a US subsidy subsidiary, it's the parent company is a European. So their culture was different. They decided to get out of the refining business, Shell, um, because they could see what was happening. The company that bought it, the founder of that company used to be the chairman of the company that owned Tosco that killed five Contra Costans 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew when they were doing that, that we were gonna go from the best performer to the worst. And I've told the air district, I've told our local reps, these guys are driven by a bottom line that will kill everybody. So um, it's a real problem. With the overall thing, I was on a local news channel yesterday and today about uh, the derailment in Ohio. I loved what Sherrod Brown said about it. That happened because of corporate greed. The the train the rail companies in the United States have the highest after tax tax profit margin of any every any industry in the United States. Um, I was one of seven members who didn't vote for the compromise on the um, the almost strike, uh, and you know I didn't like voting against the president. I told the administration I really don't want to vote. Uh, you know. If, if I'm asked to, but the oversight of this, what Sherrod Brown said of this is, is the truth from my view. Our inequality in this country and how we govern corporations, it's just too wide. So if you want 20% after-tax profit year after year, and you want growth, it's gotta come from somewhere and it comes from the workers, the consumers, it doesn't come from the shareholders. There's a wonderful interview with the CEO of Norfolk Summon on the news hour a couple nights ago. And they just said, well, if you're really committed to safety, why did you have $30 billion in open market stock buybacks? Why weren't you putting more money in the safety? And, you know, you can't answer that question. And we should stop stock buybacks. Open market, they used to be illegal in this country. Um, they're awful because it, they yeah. take the money and rather than investing in the workforce and in safety and in new products, it's killing the United States. And they're just running away with money. Chevron after what they just did to consumers in this country and you know, headquartered in my district, they did an $80 billion open market stock buyback a month ago after we know that they raised prices during COVID. They, you know, they're all in cahoots and we can't prove it, but you know, it's true. So anyways, sorry to go off on that. No, it used to be profiteering and it used to be frowned upon. No, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt helped start this, Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, come on, people, this is not good for the country. But they're so greedy. I'll tell you, our levels of inequality right now, I, 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 it drives me crazy. I don't know what these people are going to do with their billions of dollars. They're a bunch of soulless, awful human beings. Sorry, you hit a nerve. No, I, I, I know that that is. Um, but that's probably one of the major reasons, like, Probably every everybody's here on a Thursday night. Thank you so much for representing us. Well, let's work on this stuff together. We can talk about it later. I know I'm mindful of your time, but anything, let's continue the conversation, Brody, and to the degree we can do it efficiently time-wise. I'd love to have your support and keep letting people know what's going on in this country right here. Yeah, I think that's a nerve that hits all of us, the inequality and from the big corporations. So Thank you, Mark. Yes, we will work with you on what we can do about that. Um, our next question is from Cheryl Suddeth. Cheryl, speaking of somebody who's no longer my constituent. <laughs> I'm always your constituent. Uh, you can't get away from me that easily. <laughs> and I'm grateful for that. Um, 
Hello, Mark. I'm I'm very happy to see you. As a matter of fact, I'll see you next week. <laughs> we're we're together next week in DC. I see that on the calendar. Yes, sir. Um, speaking of working together, I would be remiss if I didn't say this. Um, in this February, this Black History Month, with everything that's going on, I heard you talk mm -hmm. about it earlier in the meeting, and so I wanted to say it out loud. You know, I was watching on CNN earlier, and I think they're really showing it now, this whole thing about culture wars raging in our public schools around the country. And just uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, and I miss it, so I, my question to you is when it's coming back, that uh, Mark did something that uh, nobody else has done in this area in having this beautiful conversation. Mm. Started out with him and Ms. and um, Congresswoman Lee, and then him, Congresswoman Lee, and Congresswoman Bass. And then with these, the, the most preeminent um, speakers on race relations from UC Berkeley and even Contra Costa, all of throughout the Bay Area in California. And I just wanna know when are we gonna have another one because that's really got people talking at a different level about um, you know the, the the hard conversations about yeah. race way before people were doing these things with these hashtags about the black lives matter and all of these other things and for me as you know um our pain and people suffering whether it's black or asian or latino or you know, poverty or Native American, our pain and suffering is not a hashtag. And so having those really good conversations about how do we get to true and just equity and inclusion were really valuable conversations in our community. So you were one of the you were one of the people who was not afraid to to create not uh, you know just these open conversations, but really brave spaces for people to have really true meaningful conversations. So I wanted to say that out loud. Well, we're gonna, we're, we're not stopping. Um, uh, Chanel and I talked about this yesterday, as a matter of fact, about the incident in Clayton and doing one with school kids. Um, that was a great, uh, th that started spontaneously in the house of the well after the incident in Ferguson eight years ago. Uh, yes. And I get emotional just thinking about it because I was standing there and John Lewis and Elijah Cummings, Elijah, one of the great gifts of my life to become friends with him, were sitting in their seats right in the front row there. Um, and Barbara and I were standing there and I just said, Barbara, you know, if we can't talk about this in the Bay Area and gosh knows we have enough problems, where can we? So we were able to partner with John Powell, wonderful national expert at the Haas Institute for Inclusivity at Berkeley, you know, that first one we had at Contra Costa College, you came to, he was spectacular. So we're gonna keep doing them. Um, we we took that back to the whole Democratic Caucus and it was the, Barbara and I, and we brought John back to DC. It was the best attended Democratic Caucus. Everyone acknowledges our presentation in the last 10, 15 years. So we did a template for members to do around the country and with varying success, uh, other members are doing it, but we wanna keep doing it. And I'm really now interested in uh, doing it on the, from the education committee and with younger people. The thing in Clayton sort of sped that up for me because uh, we've got to, as you said, I learned so much about myself by doing this. Yeah. Uh, Brody, I know you came to a couple of the ones at DVC and others did, so we're going to keep yeah. doing it. And we'd love to have your support and partnership in, in continuing it. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge because Barbara's running for other things. Yes. So, um, <laughs> But no, on. absolutely. Absolutely. And I just wanted to say one more thing. The thing that happened in Clayton was just one of them. But I do want to let people know if you have a chance, because my daughter was involved in the one that happened at Albany High in 2017. And that is one of the ones that sparked. Um, that's, that's, um, Clayton just happened recently, but the yeah. courts just ruled on the one from 2017 at Albany High. And so I think looking at that and looking at many of the students who were harmed in Albany High and um, even though it's not in this district, I just think it's really important yep. to look at what happened there 
and look at how the courts ruled and look at how the trickle effect can affect what happened here in Kuwait. And, and, and one, one thing, Gordy, we should, we should follow up with this with the other clubs and with the central committees. The Trumpers are doing this. I mean, yesterday, if you saw the San Ramon Valley um, school districts hearing, Mike Arata, we all know who he is, they, you know, over the LGBTQ banning books, they're, they're, they're not going away. So they're yeah. also, from what I understand on the, on the town hall that they did um, for the Mount Diablo School District is similar. They're going in and trying to cause trouble. So we, we have to be prepared to be there in numbers to bring the tone down and say, no, we're not gonna let you divide us. We wanna talk about how we live up to our expectations as Americans in Contra Costumes. Love it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I, I had some comments from the San Ramon Valley Unified School District board members who about that incident that happened um, and their meeting on Tuesday night and Michael Rada and everything. So we're going to keep focused on that. <laughs> yes. Um, I think we've gone through all our questions. Does anyone else have questions? Some people have their hands Everybody, up. I think there was a question on uh, the ask about uh, what will happen. What, what does the congressman think will happen with the debt limit? Well. Well, you know, I, I talked to my predecessor frequently, Congressman Miller. We had some funny conversations, and he said, well, if they're crazy enough to do it, I mean, there's an old saying in politics that I, George didn't tell me this, but I remember, I don't want that to happen, and I will we'll do everything to stop it. The president's doing that, too. Um, but the old saying in politics is never murder a political opponent who's committing suicide. So I don't think we'll do it because as dumb as they are, I don't think he, they're that stupid. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> but if they, the bigger problem is they're gonna, uh, they're just, what they're doing to the workforce is undiminished. You know, the Koch brothers worked on this a year. I had a meeting with region nine EPA workers today. I mean, we got a long way to build up our workforce. So it's, we can pass bills, but if we don't have the infrastructure to enforce them, um, then they get away with murder. Ooh. Wow. I, know, I didn't want to leave, lose, I didn't want to <laughs> yeah. leave on that unsharing vote. <laughs> yeah. right. No, I just, we have to stick at it. You know, we're, we're, may you live in interesting times and we do. And every everything we can do to make the America better for future generations. I mean, previous generations did it for us. That's our responsibility and it's being threatened. So, and it's working. We got a great president. He's got amazing, um, an amazing cabinet, and um, but we also have to realize they're not going to go away without a fight. Their vision of the United States is not ours. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Um, Mark, we, we, it's, you're just such a wonderful congressman. We're so happy to have you. And I'm so happy you were able to come share with us and you're doing so much. I, there's a whole lot of other legislation you're doing that we haven't even talked about, but anyway, next time, next time. So thank you so much for joining us and being our honored guest. You know, Ellen Tauscher, you, when she represented this district because she had all the labs in it, she said she gets elected by the smartest people in the world. So I will just borrow on Ellen's thing and I get elected by the smartest, most wonderful, compassionate people in the world. Oh, that's sweet. All right, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you. Compliment. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, that was just wonderful. Now we're going to move on to our second speaker, Dr. Michael Baker. He's spoken at our club years ago, and we're honored to have him speak tonight about Ukraine. Dr. Michael Baker recently returned from a second wartime trip to Ukraine where he taught advanced trauma life support and quote, stop the bleed to Ukrainian physicians and other medical personnel. He was working on behalf of the International Medical Corps and the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, which are non-governmental organizations focused on humanitarian activities. Um, the ATLS provides a concise structured approach to the injured patient so that life-threatening injuries are recognized and treated immediately. Um, the goal was to improve the care of injured patients resulting from the Russian invasion and ongoing war. Dr. Baker will, will review some history 
and geography to set the stage and then give his impressions of the morale, health care, and conditions in, U in Ukraine during this conflict. But I just wanted to give you some background about Dr. Baker is a retired general surgeon and trauma surgeon. Um, he's a World Affairs Board of Trustee member and he's OSHA lifelong learning faculty member. I'm taking a class from him right now. Um, he served 30 years in the uniform of his country, retiring from the U.S. Navy with the rank of Rear Admiral. He was awarded three Legion of Merit awards in addition to the Marine Corps Combat Action Ribbon. He's published over 880 peer-reviewed articles on a wide range of subjects from wounds and trauma to medical intelligence, pandemic response, and building the hospital ship of the future. Thank you, Dr. Baker, for joining us tonight. Brody, thank you for the invitation to speak. It's, it's really an honor, and I want to thank everybody for joining me tonight. Um, I want to uh, take you to a new place. Um, I'm going to see if I can get my screen to go where I want it to go, and uh, I'm working on it. So I'm going to Okay. And because you know, once you are in the military and you have to start giving a lot of PowerPoints, that's what you, that's what you learn to do. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna do some PowerPoint because it helps me to keep my ideas together. As Brody mentioned, uh, I've been to Ukraine a couple of times during the war. I'm going back. Uh, I, people, you know, I was reached out to by the. Um, Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and the um, International Medical Corps. Uh, I, the whole thing I, I found was really a great privilege. I, I have no problem going back. I'm happy to do it again. So I want to tonight teach you a little bit about Ukraine's history, geography, and politics. And I'm going to tell you what I did there so that you all kind of get a feeling for what's going on. So let's start with what, what am I doing going there in the middle of a war? Why is a general surgeon going there in the middle of this war? Um, and lecturing and teaching casualty care. Well, in addition to teaching that as a civilian surgeon, I'm a national course instructor and director for the American College of Surgeons teaching these courses. I had this parallel second career. Some of you may know that from my prior lecture. After I finished my surgery training and fellowship, I decided I had to serve my country. And it was very important to me to do so. And, and I needed to find a place to do it. And at the time I was reading that the Navy was very short of general surgeons. So I decided I would enter the Naval Service. Uh, here's my commissioning. This is where when I was younger, I had hair. We refer to this as prior to having children photo. Um, my first promotion photo, I couldn't find one in between, but when I got to be Lieutenant Commander, my file photo shows a fairly plain uniform that's bereft of, of much color, except for the acorn and oak leaf of a physician and the two and a half stripes of Lieutenant Commander. But I wound up staying a long time in the Naval Reserve, much more than I anticipated, with a lot of opportunity to travel and do a lot of stuff. And when I retired, as you heard, I did pick up a little color on my uniform, a few ribbons and awards, and the broad stripe of a Rear Admiral. What that did was place me in a, the opportunity to do a lot of strategic planning and a lot of operational missions in other countries. So I want to take you to Europe. It's been at peace for 75 plus years. How did this happen? Um, I'd like to joke that God created war so that Americans would learn geography. That's Mark Twain's comment. There's no question. Most of you couldn't have found Ukraine on the map a year ago. Um, but you know, 1991, Soviet Union came apart and the Ukrainians strongly supported a referendum to be a separate country and to elect their own president. They had 90% people voting to separate from the USSR. They had 84% participation of the electorate in their election. I uh, wish we had something close to that in this country. Um, and the newly elected president of Ukraine signed the accords uh, with the Russians and Belarusians saying that there's no more Soviet Union. Each of those three countries is now separate. Uh, and that lasted a while. And the map of Europe at that time looked like this with Russian in purple. Uh, Ukraine is here. Where I just put the blue star. Poland to its left, Belarus to the north, and the Black Sea, which we'll talk about uh, down here. It's kind of at five o'clock from Ukraine. So why did Putin decide to attack Ukraine? It's complicated, but not so complicated as you would think. So Ukraine 
according to him, has always been part of Russia. So we're going to take on some of his um, assertions that are not really true. And the other one that's really important is Ukrainians are actually Russians. And I don't know any Ukrainian who would tell you that they agree with that. Let's take a look at history because historically, Ukraine has been part of many countries. If you look at a map of 1619, what is today Ukraine, which is down here where I've got my cursor, is um, right where this arrow is and where I just put the star. This was part of the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth. And at one time, there were actually a lot of Poles who had settled into Ukraine uh, because they were part of that organization under the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and uh, subject to their rules. Uh, but it depends on when you look at the map. So is Ukraine really part of Russia? Well, the fact is, depending on when you look at the map, again, uh, the part that I just showed you is here in yellow that was part of the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. But if you go to the right, 1922, Lenin added what we now look at as uh, Donbass and, and Luhansk and some of these other areas like Odessa got added to Ukraine. Um, Stalin added a few pieces here in 1935 and uh, 1939, 1945 in between starving the uh, people in Ukraine, which was terrible. Khrushchev tacked on Crimea in 1954. So the maps shifted. Ukraine always was separate. But I'm going to, it's been part of many countries and empires and the borders changed often. So because I like to bring in real experts, I'm going to bring in one of my favorite historians. I want you to meet um, Yuval Harari. He's going to tell you about Ukrainians not being Russians. The most crucial thing to know is that Ukrainians are not Russians <clears throat> and that Ukraine is an ancient independent nation. Ukraine has a history of more than a thousand years. Kyiv was a major metropolis and cultural center when Moscow was not even a village. Uh, for centuries, Kyiv was looking westwards and was a part of a union with Lithuania and Poland. His belief was, at least, that he just needs to uh, uh, invade. Zelensky will flee, uh, the government will collapse, the army would lay down its arms, and the Ukrainian people would welcome uh, the Russian liberators throwing flowers on them. Well, those babushkas weren't throwing flowers. They were throwing Molotov cocktails. So The Ukrainians are a very real nation. They are fiercely independent. They don't want to be part of Russia. They will fight like hell. And that's exactly what we've seen. So um, we look at the first reason that Putin put forward. Ukraine's always part of Russia. Not true at all. Ukrainians are actually Russians. Not true at all. Ukraine is controlled by Nazis. You know, that's crazy. That's that's like all Democrats are communists now. That's the thing I heard today in the news, right? The one that's important for all of us is NATO is getting too close and threatens Russia. And Ukraine might someday join NATO, which, by the way, was looked at as about a 20-year process. But Putin says NATO is getting too close. Let's look at the map. This is really important stuff. The darker purple countries here that you see, like Great Britain and Spain and France, you know, they're part of NATO as of about 1997. Uh, the lighter purple countries, numbered 1 through 14, are prior Soviet Union republics that joined NATO the minute they could get out of the USSR. We're looking at the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. We're looking at Poland, Czechoslovakia. They didn't want to be part of Russia. Uh, but what's really important here is that, you know, looking at Ukraine, where I just put the gold star, I'll do it again. Uh, you know, there is already a border between two of the states in NATO that borders Russia. They already touch it. And if you look down here where I just put this bigger area, you know, Turkey is incredibly close, a hop and a skip. But the really big one that's kind of crazy, if you don't know about it, I want everybody to know about where this red arrow is. And I'm going to show you again. This red arrow points to Kaliningrad. If you read the hunt from Hunt for Red October, I believe this is where he launched his submarine. So this is a base still owned by Russia where there's nuclear subs, nuclear weapons, all kinds of armaments, and uh, it's in the middle of NATO. How much closer can NATO get to Russia other than having, I don't know, what we in surgery would call this a metastasis uh, into NATO. But, you know, the fact is Russia already touched uh, NATO in several places and including Kaliningrad, which is right in the middle. So, you know, that's a, a kind of a very specious argument. Interestingly, because of the current events, previously neutral Finland and Sweden rushed to join NATO for self-defense. 
you know, the Finns fought off the Russians back just before we entered World War II. Uh, country of five million people with tremendous leadership. And, you know, by them joining NATO, which, uh, you know, now you have Ukraine down here where I just put this arrow for, and star for you. Uh, up here, uh, you have Sweden and Finland joining NATO. And, and guess what? Now you have 800 miles more of NATO countries bordering Russia. Uh, so, you know, this is really a pretty interesting thing that Russia got exactly the opposite of what it sought. But NATO and Russia already have borders. Whether Ukraine is a common border or not would make no difference, really. And remember, Kaliningrad, where I just put up the, the red star, you know, Kaliningrad, right in the middle of NATO. Um, there's trains and lines and roads from Belarus, from Russia through Belarus, which is a, you know, Russian sympathizing country right into Kaliningrad. So, you know, those are all kind of nonsense. So, so why did Russia really invade Ukraine? Part of it is said by experts to erase the humiliation of the Soviet collapse. We'll talk more about that. Very important for Putin to regain control of a separatist republic and to be a powerful guy on the world stage. But what he really is interested in is he wants to restore the glory of the Russian Empire. And he sees himself as Peter the Great. He's made references to that in his discussions. Um, but also, why does Ukraine matter? Well, we have to follow the money. Um, you know, Congressman de Saulnier was very great about mentioning the fact that the pipelines for Russian oil and gas go right through Ukraine, as you can see on this map. Uh, and Ukraine charges a tariff, and the Russians don't want to pay it. So, you know, if they owned Ukraine, they wouldn't have to pay to transit their gas and oil through Ukraine. So, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. Uh, and, and that gas, of course, is very important to Germany, Italy, France, and, you know, all our NATO allies. They, a lot of them made themselves a little over-dependent on it. They're trying to figure out a way to get out from under that. Uh, Ukraine also has a tremendous amount of natural resources. It has a lot of uranium ore. It has titanium ore. Um, it has all kinds of things like manganese and other rare earths that you were looking for. It has the second largest iron ore reserves in the world. And you know, they used to do a lot of steel making before the war started and all the plants got taken out. If you look at a a uh, map of what kind of minerals and things are, are in um, Ukraine. It is a very, very uh, blessed country in terms of minerals and all kinds of things. So um, that's why there is a lot of manufacturing, but there's also a lot of agriculture. They are able to not only grow their own, but to meet the food needs of 600 million people by exporting, which is amazing. That's been cut off by the war, but they sent food all over the world, including a lot of it to India and Egypt and to the countries of North Africa, some into China, all the things, the products that you see at the bottom. Uh, it is a very, very, very agricultural robust country in addition to its industry. So it's a valuable gem to be brought back under control of Russia because they were doing and making a lot of money. And I have to say the standard of living is probably a great deal higher in Ukraine because they're part of uh, you know, this distribution of things around the world, but they're more tied into the global network. You know, Russia, you know, other than exporting trouble and vodka and caviar, and of course, natural gas and oil, doesn't really have a lot. Nobody's buying their autos or any of the things they make or any of the things they really grow. But most important, Putin cannot tolerate a free and democratic country next door because it makes him look bad. So I've got a little clip here from Ambassador Ivo Dalder, who was the ambassador to NATO. Vladimir Putin's objective is to keep Ukraine, the second largest country on the continent, from making common cause with the democracies of Europe. What motivates Putin is a concern about the independence of Ukraine, a worry that a, a functioning, successful, prosperous democracy in Ukraine poses a direct threat to his rule because it will give people in Russia the idea that they too could enjoy what Ukraine uh, enjoys and rise up against his autocratic rule. So they just can't tolerate having a free, democratic, prosperous country. So um, what does all this mean for us? Um, if you go back and look at his speeches in 2007, Putin stated that the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. Uh, I'm only an amateur historian, but I seem to remember World War I and World War II and the Great Depression 
and the 1918 flu epidemic with maybe as many as 50 million deaths. I mean, there's a lot of things more than just uh, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. So, you know, I just, you, you got to look at these things and uh, it's a little crazy. So what does Putin do? Well, here comes uh, his, his own talk and, and maybe a little comment for me on the side. What does Putin do? Мы не принято решение о проведении специальной военной операции. Sorry, I have to comment. It is a war, stupid. It's not a special military operation. Uh, fact of the matter is. Ее цель защита людей, которые на протяжении восьми лет подвергаются издевательствам, геноциду со стороны киевского режима. Sorry, I think he's the war criminal, and his guys are are pretty brutal. Кто бы не пытался помешать нам, а тем более создать угрозы для нашей страны, для нашей страны. Его народа должны знать, что ответ России будет незамедлительным и приведет вас к таким последствиям, с которыми вы в своей истории еще никогда не сталкивались. Threat about nuclear war. Мы готовы к любому развитию событий. So I'm attempted to quote the Ukrainian soldiers on Snake Island when they were told to surrender by the Russian battleship Moskva, but I promised myself I would never swear on any of these things. So I will simply uh, channel uh, this poster that I see around Kiev and around on T-shirts um, as the, my response to Putin. Uh, those 18 guys were pretty brave to face off that battleship. So let's look at his special military operation. When Vladimir Putin invaded a peaceful Ukraine, his brutal shock troops committed hideous war crimes against women, children, and the elderly. He bombed cities, towns, and villages. So I guess if I can't win, I'll blow up all the infrastructure and hurt the civilians and ruin the country. They've lost 40% of their GDP so far in 2022. I mean, it's really hurt their economy. Um, I have a friend and a shipmate, another naval guy named Malcolm Nance. You might have seen him on MSNBC before the war started. He was fighting. He's fighting with the International Legion. He got involved very early. The International Legion is important to this story because it has 25,000 volunteers in the International Legion uh, from over 50 countries. And they do background checks and psyche valves, unlike the Wagner Group, which simply empties out the prisons and jails and takes all the bad guys. Uh, he returned home for a week last August to promote his new book, which he wrote before the war started. And uh, it's an interesting book about they want to kill Americans, about militias and terrorists and the Trump insurgency. Uh, actually a good read, but it, it will disturb your sleep. Um, and he's a fairly, he's a really charming guy and he's really friendly. And we went out to talk and, and it, we had a, you know, I learned what a French 75 was. It was a cocktail I had to look up on Wikipedia. I didn't have one because I had to drive home. Uh, but he and I talked for several hours about the war. And lo and behold, not long after, um, you know, I, I went back and I saw what he had done before. He was on NPR, uh, at, excuse me, at the Commonwealth Club. And he talks about when he was on MSNBC before the war. And I said this on MSNBC. I said, these guys are going to fight. I can tell by the look in this man's eye. Right. He is ready to kick Russian ass. And I said this on one of the MSNBC shows about three or four days before the invasion. And they were like, well, you know, the invasion will be quick. They'll right. lose rather fast. And I said, hey, let me tell you something. They I were talking in... about the Ukrainians losing. Right. They the said Ukrainians the Ukrainians, losing... he would be in there within two weeks. It would all be over. Right. Yeah. Kiev would be taken in right. 72 hours. And, and I you still some... believe that, that the sure. Ukrainians are going to win. Sure. So, you know, I mean, I'm a member of the International Legion. I, you know, I, I am with the forces that are fighting the Russians on the front line on the Eastern Front. Russia, definitively, without any question, is going to lose this war. Pretty amazing prediction. So he predicted Ukrainian victory. Let's see how the war went after that first 20. The Ukrainians put their courageous soldiers in the line of fire. With great sacrifice, this alliance broke the invasion, pushed it back liberated millions. Victory for Ukraine is in sight. This is hopeful. There's a lot more to be done, but I, I can't tell you how impressed I am with their courage, their bravery, uh, everything that they're doing. And uh, 
you know, I, I think they've, they've really stood tall. Um, very, very impressive. So what are Putin's achievements in this whole thing? Well, he's killed thousands of Ukrainians, a lot of them civilians. 13 million Ukrainians have been, been displaced. Can you imagine that number of people picking up their backpack and their suitcase on rollers and running for the border or for another part of the country? Uh, six and a half, 6.6 6 million at one time were refugees across Europe. They fled into Poland, they fled into Kazakhstan, um, they split into Romania. And you know, those countries were incredibly gracious in receiving them. They've been, I gotta give the Poles tremendous credit. Uh, about a million and a half to three million, according to the UNHCR, uh, were kidnapped into Russia. Uh, you know, if they were in those eastern provinces and those villages that, you know, that got overrun early in the war, a lot of them got sent to camps in Russia. Um, and a lot of those kids have been put in school so they can learn Russian, which is pretty terrible. And as I mentioned, Ukraine lost a big piece of their economy, 40%. So Putin, you accomplished a lot, could have done a lot better with trade. Uh, but this is what you accomplished, you know, thousands and thousands of, of people dying, um, maybe as many as 250,000 Russian casualties. That's what I heard this morning on one of the intelligence feeds, that the numbers are hard to figure out. You have to use everything from satellite data to cell phone intercepts to all kinds of things to figure out, you know, how many tanks have been blown up and how many armored vehicles and all things like that. So they may have lost over 4,000 armored vehicles, according to our Assistant Secretary of Defense. Um, but, you know, on the Ukrainian side, the Russians have bombed and destroyed about 130,000 buildings. That's a lot of buildings. Think about having 10 or 20 here. Uh, I'm particularly interested in healthcare. They've heavily damaged 800 Ukrainian hospitals, and 127 were destroyed. According to their Department of Health, they referred to them as being piles of rubble. Um, can you imagine if we lost one or two hospitals here in Contra Costa, what, what a hit that would be on our health care? And here we are in the middle of a war. Um, so, you know, this, this, is, this is what Putin's doing to Ukraine. Uh, if you can't conquer it, let's just destroy it. How would you like to rebuild your house? It looked like that. Um, how would you, what are you going to do about your apartment buildings? You know, all these people probably had to leave and, and go somewhere uh, to the West, maybe to another country, but at least to the West to be safe. This is the beautiful town of Mariupol. Uh, before, up at the top of your picture here before the war started. This is what it looks like now uh, with drone imagery. It's, it's staggering. And, and here's another great example of uh, what I think of as a non-military target. Let's punish civilians. You know, this is, this is an apartment building. Why are we targeting apartments? Uh, Russian missiles blew the middle right out of this apartment building. Uh, it, it is very tragic. They killed over 40 people. They injured and wounded a lot. Uh, a lot of people were displaced from their homes. It was one of the biggest casualty rate hits on civilians in one time. And, you know, that 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 room you just saw, you know, they lived there. Uh, you can see it in the lower corner there. Uh, but they blew the wall off there. They can't live there anymore. And dad got killed in the in the attack. I mean, it's Putin's legacy. Um, so now, you know, the question I get asked sometimes at these talks is, you know, should Ukraine negotiate with Putin? I'm going to bring in another expert, Gary Kasparov. You know, the former grandmaster of chess has been an anti-Putin activist for decades. He's actually been in Russian prison. He wrote an interesting book before the war started that said, winter is coming, that Vladimir Putin and his guys are the enemies of the free world. And I want to channel him for a minute because he's very eloquent on dictators and tyrants. Ukraine is now on the front line of the war, global war, of freedom against tyranny. Brave Ukrainians are fighting like hell and dying right now to remind us not to take liberty for granted. Putin, like every dictator before him, underestimated the free will of free people. They deserve every weapon, every resource to win this war because they're fighting for us, not only for the whole and free Ukraine. The price of stopping a dictator always goes up with every delay, every hesitation. Meeting evil halfway, it's still a victory for evil. What kind of civilization we are fighting for if we allow war crimes and genocide again, 
Sometimes you have to fight for what you believe. Or you lose it. This is not chess. There are no draws, no compromises in our battle with true evil. It's win or lose. And so we must fight. And so we must win. Slava Ukraini! Glory to Ukraine! Glory to freedom! Thank you. I'm very skeptical about negotiating. I think Gary Kasparov's right on. Every time we hesitated, whether the Russians invaded Georgia, when the Russians took Crimea, every time we hesitated, he retooled and came back for a little bigger bite of the pie, and he would do it again. And if he's successful, what can we expect? Well, the next stop, he's got to get that road open to Kaliningrad because the Lithuanians have shut it. And then maybe he's going to take a look at Moldova and some of the other places like the Baltic countries. If you look at the map, you know, I already told you Russia's over here on the right. Uh, Kaliningrad is right here. Uh, he needs to get these roads and railroads opened again so that he can support his, na support his naval base. And, you know, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia are, are probably the, the plum targets if he dares to take on NATO. But, you know, if NATO had fractured, uh, that might have been next. What I still think is, is great risk right now, if you look at the map of Ukraine, this is actually a battle map. It shows the Russian troop elements here with the red arrows. Uh, they're in Mariupol, they're in Melitopol, they're heading up towards Mykolaiv, they're bombing Kherson today, it's a contested area, they hold Crimea down here, but what I want you to see over here on the left is Moldova. My second trip to Ukraine, I flew into Chisinau, went to Ukraine. If you look at this map, you know, you don't have to be a general to realize that you need to get this part and Moldova in, in your control. You can close off uh the entire country of Ukraine from the Black Sea, they won't be able to export things very easily. So you would really need to get your guys across here. The Ukrainians are fighting them there very hard here around Kherson and, and Mykolaiv to keep this from happening. And there's, believe it or not, this little orange stripe here is occupied by Russian troops who came there under the guise several years ago of doing some kind of peacekeeping because Russian speaking people in that part of Moldova uh, were saying they were being picked on. So we've, we've heard this excuse before uh, that there's a genocide in uh, Ukraine, a genocide in Moldova. Uh, but you know, ultimately had the war gone better, Moldova and this part of it here called Transnistria and probably Kaliningrad would all be part of uh, the gains. So let's take you to why I went to a conflict zone. Uh, did not make my family very happy when they found out where I went because they didn't know till after I was there. Uh, because in the world I live in, you do not telegraph where you're going um, and because it's a security thing. So, and or when you're going. So my feeling is, and, and you can quote me anytime, democracy under attack anywhere is an attack on democracy everywhere. And, and I'll come back to that theme because I think this is really important for us. And I, you know, like I said, if they had attacked democracy in Ukraine, the next stop would be democracy, maybe in Moldova, um, you know, which is hanging on. So we know Russia's invasion of Ukraine had no basis in fact. The Ukrainians are fighting for their homeland. They voted to be a separate country. The UN, the United Nations, is supposed to guarantee them sovereignty. There were accords signed with Russia and Belarus that said that they would, you know, respect their borders. I have American and European friends in combat. Uh, you met one already, you're going to meet him again. So, you know, I was asked to teach casualty care skills. I'm a national instructor and course director for Advanced Trauma Life Support, American College of Surgeons. Uh, I'm a little old to join my friends in the International Legion, you know, pick up a flak jacket and a rifle. That's, I'm, I'm past that. Those days are over. Um, but it's a humanitarian ask. You know, I'm not going there to, to fight the war. I'm going there to save lives. I'm very willing to do that. Um, and I'm going to give you a little feel for my trip. So I traveled there in August 2022, right after I had met uh, Malcolm Nance. To, I went there to teach ATLS. Sponsors, you heard, International Medical Corps, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. ATLS trains medical providers to manage acute injuries. As you'll see, I'll show you a little bit. It's sponsored by the American College of Surgeons. That's, that's kind of our guild, you know. Um, you start off with a flight to Warsaw, which if I had gone here on United would be 12 hours, but I had to fly to LA to pick up lot airlines, which I 
had a trouble finding because no one in LA airport knew which terminal it was in, but I found it. So that's about 18 hours to get to Warsaw, which is very interesting. Um, those of you who fly know that if you go over the curve of the globe, it's, uh, it is shorter distance than going in a straight line. I always have a little trouble with that concept and I laugh about it with my kids, but it, it is true if you're looking at a globe. So, you know, you fly from here in the San Francisco, went down to LA, then across over Greenland to Warsaw over here where the red arrow just came up. And then I caught a connecting flight to this town here. And I went to the desk and I said, how do you pronounce this? And the lady looks at me and she goes, it's Zhezhov, just like it's spelled and kind of laughs. And I, I go, really? Well, okay. So now I know, how do you pronounce that? It's Zhezhov, just like it's spelled. So I catch my connecting flight from Warsaw here where the star is down to Zhezhov, just like it's spelled here where I just put the blue arrow. You can see it's close to the Ukraine border. Uh, we take a van to the border the morning after we arrived. We take about an hour to walk through immigration to get into Ukraine through two checkpoints, one on each country's side. We meet a van on the other side, on the Ukrainian side. Uh, the reason we did that is because the line at the um, of cars and buses and trucks you know, was about 24 hours long to get into Ukraine. I mean, there's a massive amount of shipping going through there. So I drew a blue line here from Zhezhov uh, where I just put this arrow uh, over to Kyiv, but it was not a straight line that we took. We zigzagged because we didn't want to be in any of those convoys that were carrying weapons. So it was an eight hour trip on side roads. These trips take a while. Uh, you may remember a couple of days ago, President Biden took 10 hours by train uh, to make some stops when there's danger. And we got to Kiev after our zip, and it felt safe, but it was clearly a country at war, which is what I want to show you. We had checkpoints in lots of places. There were soldiers in fighting posts, particularly in front of government buildings and other key structures. There were armed guards patrolling, particularly after 10 at night because of the curfew to you know, prevent any kind of sabotage. There were air raid sirens periodically, and you install an app when you enter Ukraine, and you get the air raid siren on your phone. Um, there's bomb shelters. Every school now in Ukraine has to have a bomb shelter. It's, it's very, very tragic, and the kids have to carry uh, little bags like our little our kids used to have those earthquake bags when they went to school. These kids all have to have the equivalent of that uh, for food and water and stuff to keep them through 24 hours. Um, when you're driving to Ukraine, um, you go past these checkpoints. So if you look over here in this picture, they don't like you taking pictures of their stuff because that's what the bad guys do to plan a raid. So this is one of these checkpoints. So I'm going to show you there's one on either side of the road. It's a serpentine to make the truck slow down. The sandbags, big concrete blocks. So I'm taking one from on my side of the road. You can see it here. You can't drive straight through this. You have to slow down. And that's what the serpentine does. All U.S. military bases have serpentines at the front gate to slow people down so the guards can see what's going on. It's very important. Uh, when I got there, I checked with our security guys because we had a guy there to kind of look out for us and it was okay to walk around. So I, I did some sightseeing. I was advised everywhere you go to see where the nearest blast barrier was if you had to take shelter in a hurry from something coming your way. Uh, some of these were manned with guards, but you know, you just wanted to know where the closest one was, especially if you're like me, uh, you're not very fast anymore. Uh, I went up to St. Michael's Cathedral and some of the other sites to see. Uh, there's a lot of burned out Russian equipment on display, uh, armored cars, tanks, things like that. Uh, President Biden walked here with Zelensky this week, so it felt very familiar. One of the interesting things that you see there is that they have sandbagged all their statues and monuments to keep the Russians from being spiteful and destroying their culture. And down here, you can see the little sign, world help us. There's some other signs here that are a little smaller, but you know, yeah, we're going to come back to this. So here I am, I come there to teach advanced trauma life support. It trains medical providers to manage acute injuries, sponsored by the ACS, introduced in 1980 after a plane crash with an orthopedic surgeon and his family, and he felt that the care that they got was very substandard. He felt that it, there should be a standardized way to treat casualties. Um, the course has been taught to over a million doctors and other medical professionals, sometimes trauma nurses, sometimes physicians assistants in 81 countries. But Ukraine was not certified yet to be an ATLS provider. You have to have a fair amount of 
surgery infrastructure and surgeons in your country who uh, can help sponsor this. So, you know, we, we got the waivers to do this and went to teach them what we knew. Um, it, ATLS focuses on that first opportunity to assess and stabilize a patient. Uh, it, it provides an organized foundation. It's very important that we all do it the same way. We teach a common language. We teach a common algorithm, a standard approach to what we do, uh, as I'll show you briefly. For care, what used to be called during the golden hour, uh, but it might be the golden five minutes. You might only have five minutes to take care of something. So, um, but we try to make it organized. So we have didactic lectures uh, followed by skill stations that are hands-on, which I'll show you. Uh, this is one of my interpreters. After about the third lecture, I think he could have given the whole class without me, um, but he was fabulous and knowledgeable. Every night, our interpreters would go through uh, the slides and make sure that the person who had translated it using Google Translate didn't leave things in there that were sort of culturally inappropriate. They made some really funny finds and, and made the language run a lot smoother because obviously they speak Ukrainian. Here's my interpreter during this particular lecture. Um, these guys were great. Um, so our protocol language is so basic, we use an ABC algorithm. A is for airway. You got to make sure the airway is open. B is going to be for breathing. You got to make sure you can hear breath sounds, patients exchanging oxygen. C is for circulation. If there's active bleeding, you got to stop it. If there's a problem with the heart pumping, you got to start it. Uh, D is disability, having to do you know, paralysis, uh, head injuries, things like that fractures to keep you from moving, what are the disabilities? And E stands for both exposure, you know, so you can see where the wounds are and controlling the environment. Particularly now, this time of year, we worry about hypothermia. Once you go through this algorithm, you come back and you do a secondary survey in more depth. You turn the patient and it's a, a very comprehensive exam, time and circumstances permitting. If you're doing it on the battlefield, sometimes you gotta stop what you're doing to move to safety, you and the patient, uh, and then start over. So when they, when they do the ABCs, if they find something wrong, they've got to intervene with a life-saving intervention. That's part of what we're teaching. So if we flunk A and the airway is not open, we teach them maneuvers like a jaw thrust, things that you might learn in, in your basic stuff. Uh, if we need to secure the airway, it means they have to learn how to intubate like your anesthesiologist in the hospital or perform a cricothyroidotomy, which is a surgical airway. I'm going to show you a little bit about that. Uh, you got to make sure they're breathing. Listen to the lungs. Do they need a chest tube because they've got a pneumothorax or something going on in the lungs? Circulation, you know, if they're bleeding, I mentioned tourniquets, pressure dressings are crucial. Um, and then when you do one of these interventions, we teach them to go back and resume their ABCs right from the beginning. That's extremely important because things change. The other thing is we teach them that when the patient gets moved, loaded and unloaded from an ambulance, you probably need to go through these things again to make sure everything's still okay. In the hospital where I worked for many years, um, you know, if the patient went to CT scan when they came back, I went over them again. Sometimes I actually went with them to CT scan because uh, they were unstable. But you know, you want to use this algorithm so that you don't forget anything important. So when we did skill stations, we used mannequins. This is totally new for. Uh, these were purchased by um, IMC and HHI. Uh, my interpreter here in this particular scenario, I've got four doctor students, um, and we're showing them how to do the various steps. There's several skill stations. This skill station, you can see he's got his left hand fingers on, on the trachea, and his right hand is a scalpel, and he's going to do a surgical mannequin. The mannequins uh, have, you know, sort of airway models and rubber skins over them, so we can show them technically how to do it, uh, make sure that they understand the technique. Because those of you who teach know that it's one thing to read the book, another thing to hear the lecture, but you can really get this information in people's brains if they do it with their hands. They go to the lab. This is basically what it is. I'm going to show you a little graphic demonstration because we taught in between the ATLS courses, we taught what's called Stop the Bleed, STB, also an American College of Surgeons course. Um, again, you have to be certified as an instructor. Uh, but we taught this uh, to not to the doctors. We taught this to lots of other people, as I'll show you. And here's kind of a mannequin showing you what Stop the Bleed's about. Once life-threatening hemorrhage has been identified, immediately expose the wound and visualize the bleeding. Place direct pressure over the wound to begin to slow bleeding while opening the combat gauze. Remove the product 
and begin to place the gauze into the wound. So this is a mannequin. That's why it's quiet. You don't hear the guy screaming that this hurts when you do it. It's a mannequin. We taught stop the bleed to non-medical people or people not in hospitals. So we taught school teachers, librarians, station masters, bus drivers. I had a landscape guy from the hospital who wanted to be able to help people. Um, you know, they were so grateful. They were so interested. Um, and everybody got a kit with pressure dressings and tourniquets and other things when they left, when they completed the course successfully. So while I'm teaching this the first time I'm there, which is in Kiev, I got involved in a little side hustle uh, because of my friend, Malcolm Nance. You know, us sailors got to stick together. So what does Malcolm need from me? He gets on WhatsApp, sends me a picture of his game face. This is him out in Donetsk getting ready. He says, we need IV insertion needles, infusion tubing, and resuscitation fluid. The supply chain is not reaching us, and a major offensive is coming soon. My medics are out of stuff. So we need to stabilize our wounded. Can you get me this stuff? Um, so what am I going to say, right? I got my interpreters in gear. I scoured the pharmacy and medical supply houses in Kiev. Uh, when I had everything on his list, I texted him on WhatsApp. We use it's encrypted, so it's reasonably safe. Uh, the Uber driver was a little shocked when I loaded the back seat in the trunk with all this stuff from the pharmacies and everything. I had other people, you know, it was just amazing. Took it to my hotel and I WhatsApped him and I said, I've got the stuff. What should I do? He said, My courier will be there in an hour. His code name is Santa Claus. Santa Claus comes, opens his van door. A lot of interesting things in this guy's van. He takes all my supplies, says in 12 hours, I will be at the front delivering this to the International Legion. Uh, and I get a WhatsApp picture from Malcolm Nance from his one of his medics. You can see the medic's gun and pack is here, but he's holding up the IV fluid, basically sent me a thank you uh, for, for doing this because they were moving up. And they started that Eastern offensive the next day, you know, when they took back half of the Russian gains in the East, that was the following day. So. You know, I've got to help in that little little piece of uh, assistance for them. Uh, but what did our teams really accomplish? Well, it was very interesting. Uh, we had 150 doctors and nurses uh, complete ATLS. We had over 300 people take Stop the Bleed and, and leave with kits. The doctors also got kits for this stuff at ATLS. Uh, everybody got a certificate of completion from uh, our sponsoring groups. You can see there are a couple other hospitals in, in the loop here in addition to HHI. Um, by the way, people were extremely grateful. And one of the guys um, comes up to me, you know, after we went through this ATLS, it concentrates on that first hour post-injury. It's all about saving lives at immediate risk. One of the students comes up to me after the course. Uh, he's in camouflage. He tells me he just finished his anesthesia residency uh, and he's going to the front tomorrow. And he says, you know, the purpose of ATLS, I can see it. It's, it's I want to quote to you from the Talmud, and he eloquently quotes to me. He says, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. And I said, you know, I've not exactly read the Talmud, but I've, I've heard this before. And it took me a while to remember where I had heard it, but, you know, it, it came to me. And you might remember this. This is from Schindler's List. I remembered where I heard it. Hebrew from the Talmud, it says, whoever saves one life, saves the world entire. Great movie, great story, great violin music by Itzhak Perlman there playing the theme. Um, I taught, and I've been back a second time to Odessa, which was another adventure because I went through Bucharest, Romania, through Chisinau, Moldova, and, and towards the Black Sea. Uh, but I learned a lot by my two trips so far. Uh, number one is Ukrainians are highly educated people. They're very impressive. Uh, they're tech savvy and they're entrepreneurial. Uh, they will rebuild their country. The younger generation adopted English. So whenever I got lost out of the hotel, 
Uh, I could stop anybody under 30, and there's a pretty good chance they could get me to where I needed to go with English. Um, they carry on a normal life in the face of adversity. Uh, I, I was amazed people were sitting in the cafes, they were having lunch outside. You know, sometimes they might move indoors if the alarms, you know, the bomb alarms went off, the air raid alarms, but they pretty much tried to carry on a normal life. I mean, it's amazing. Um, and they are highly patriotic. This is extremely important. It's why they're winning. Um, some of the expressions and patriotism of solidarity and stuff that I saw traveling around in, in Kiev and in Odessa, there's a lot of murals on the sides of buildings. Um, stand with Ukraine. This is you know for people who want to do donations. Um, they have a painting of one of their saints on one of the apartment buildings holding an anti-tank weapon. It's one of my favorites. Uh, clearly uh, sent by God to, to help, right? Um, so, and I mentioned the Ukrainian soldiers responding to the Russian ship Moscow's, you know, attempt to surrender. This poster is around uh, Kiev quite a bit too. So not wanting to swear like a sailor, I want to switch gears. Uh, you know, every generation has its examples of valor. And I know a lot of you are my age peers, and you know this picture, the Marines raising the flag on Mount Suribachi during World War II. Um, you know, an iconic photo of these brave young men doing their duty. Um, I think this is an iconic photo of our generation. Um, this is Vladimir Zelensky, Jewish. Grandfather fought the Nazis. Many of his relatives were killed in the Holocaust. He's standing up to a dictator because he's brave, because he knows what happens if you don't. Uh, he was offered a ride out of Kiev when the invasion started. He said, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. And he's become this guy, a tough leader of an embattled country. And I just can't tell you how impressed I am with him. I think he's this generation's Winston Churchill. Remember this guy? He gave the most amazing speeches. And I want to share one with you. I think that's apropos. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Never yield to force. I mean, I think he's amazing. The other thing that's amazing that I learned and I want to share with you, their kids are amazing. Um, here's some advice from students that I pulled from a video I edited. They're at a middle school. They range in age from 13 to 15. Looking back, I'm raising my kids. I, I, these kids bowl me over. I think they'll bowl you over too. Generation who uh, has to uh, promote it to develop our country after the war. Soldiers now are fighting in the south and east of Ukraine. And we have to fight here. We have to develop our skills. We have to make a future and a history for our country. It's something that's happening right now. It's a real crime, a real genocide, and you cannot forget about it. People need to remember, people have to care, and it's not something that only affects Ukrainians. It's something that will sooner or later affect the whole world. If you don't help us now, you'll be the next. You'll be the next who will be in the war with this evil who has arisen from the ashes of your indecision. So decide now, or you just you will need to fight with this on your own land. It's just excruciating to see people dying because of their nationality, because they are Ukrainians. So you just, you don't need that. So help us now. Pretty impressive. Fluent English, 13 to 15 years old. I'm so impressed. Um, so I'm frequently asked with all the terrible things going on in the world, you know, not just in Ukraine, but some of it in our own country, other things in places like Turkey, certainly didn't get any breaks this week. How can I be optimistic? What, what makes me optimistic about the future? Well, the next generation gives me hope, just like those kids you just saw. And I want to give you another example. These kids during an air raid are practicing for a performance. They're in the bomb shelter basement, basically, by candlelight and cell phone light. Over the last few weeks, they rehearsed in Kyiv, at times practicing in a bomb shelter without electricity. Oh. 
their impromptu performance last week. <laughs> nearly bringing Grand Central Terminal to a standstill. This classic song of the season. Today, a song of survival. Ukraine's Shedrick Children's Choir performing Carol of the Bells today at New York's Carnegie Hall. The holiday favorite, written by a Ukrainian composer, premiered here a century ago. Carol of the Bells, its message of good tidings, now ever more meaningful for this chorus. Kids give me hope. Today, proving joy and hope can prevail. I sure hope so. So I didn't know that the song was 100 years old and written by a Ukrainian. Pretty interesting when you start digging up facts. I want to bring in one more historian before I close and open the evening to questions. Professor Timothy Snyder, a Yale uh, professor, amazing historian, brilliant guy. Um, he's written a lot of stuff. And, and he said, one of the things I quote for tonight is, if none of us is prepared to die for freedom, then all of us will die in unfreedom. We must be prepared for courageous acts. If we are passive rather than acting with courage, we'll be easy targets. Now I've edited it this, you know, for brevity, um, but it brings me to the, to the next point, which I think is really important. Uh, again, using one of my favorite clips, um, the point I want to make is this. The welcome makes the fight. This time I know our side will win. <laughs> So I want to close with the thought that all of us need to be active in this fight, just like you see him quoting at the end of Casablanca. Uh, there's, you know, authoritarian tendencies here uh, and, and around other countries. We need to fight it everywhere. Uh, I want to end with Slava Ukraini, as my colleague Gary Kasparov said, glory to Ukraine. They're fighting for their homes. We need to give them everything they need uh, because they're fighting for us. And uh, with that, I'm going to bring us all to a stop, and uh, I'm going to stop my screen share and open up to the gallery um, if anybody has a question. And I will stay as long as you guys want, or Brody lets me, um, either or. So please, hands up, and Brody, do you want to call people or unmute them or however if there's a question? Yes. Um, with the hearing those children, you almost have me in tears. And that was just a fascinating talk, just really fascinating. Um, and um, can we have, are we still screen sharing? We can't see the audience. Okay, hold on. Let me see. I got it. <laughs> Let's see if there are any questions. There we go. There we go. So um, are these, do people have their hands up from previously or are these hand, new hands? Ellison Sharon, is this a new question? It, it, it might as well be. How do you see this thing ending? You know, everybody asks me that. Thank you for the question. How do I see it ending? Uh, I don't see it ending soon. Uh, I'm very concerned about, you know, the little rumbles coming out of China that they might start helping Russia, which would be an incredibly tragic thing. And, and the other thing that bothers me immensely is that there are neutral countries like India, in South Africa that are kind of playing footsie with the Russians because they can buy oil and gas cheap right now. And it's in their self-interest to do so. But, you know, it's kind of violates the world order that we all fought to maintain. So how do I see it ending? I, you know, if there's a really good ending, um, it would be that Putin gets deposed. Uh, I will quote Rudyard Kipling, one of my favorite authors, remember Jung Jungle Book, uh, the head of the wolves, fails to catch his prey and the other wolves take him down. You know, I'm kind of hoping here that his uh, anniversary of starting the war, which is tomorrow, uh, 
everybody's going to realize, you know, a lot of their kids got killed for nothing. Their economy is getting hammered. Maybe it's time for a change of command. Um, I've, I've heard other possibilities. None of us know. None of us can get into the mind of Putin. But the experts who do have an opinion say that he'll never give up. He'll keep escalating because he knows if he gives up, he's going to be deposed and probably uh, will, you know, get put in prison or otherwise harmed. His tenure would be very short. Let's hope. Okay. But the end of Putin leaves us in chaos. Not, not just us, the whole world in chaos. Well, not necessarily. Somebody's going to take over. The only problem is you don't know if his successor would be better or worse. You know, Venezuela had a change of command, uh, and I think the guy they have now is equally as bad, as not worse, than the dictator that, that uh, you know, he replaced. You just don't know. Um, and it's hard to gauge the Russian people. You know, he's seen, Putin seems to have a lot of support, certainly from the elites who are making money off the war. It seems to be they're, they're very happy. Uh, but, you know, if your kid went out to, to do this thing, uh, you know, some, some younger people in Russia who have access through VPNs and, and like Telegram uh, apps to, to see what's really going on in the world are getting a clue that this isn't going to happen. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Julie, do you have a question? Um, yes, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I think um, everyone I know would like to be in the fight in some way to support. What are the ways that you think are the most effective ways for an average citizen to, to, um, to support the fight? Well, I'm going to give you a couple options. I, I tend to avoid fingering specific charities because I got burned previously by a veterans charity where the guys took all the money and, and went on vacations with it. Um, but, you know, one of the groups so I'll give you, if, if you're not, you know, militaristic in, in your definition of what you want to do, uh, I really like World Central Kitchen. I think Chef Andres has the biggest heart I've ever seen. Uh, I yeah. saw the food distribution kitchens in Ukraine. Uh, I saw them go right to Turkey after the earthquake. I, I think they're phenomenal humanitarians, and, and so I send them support. Um, there are other groups, you know, that are buying weapons and ammunition and body armor. Uh, I could put you in touch if you want to send me an email through Brody. I can recommend one that I actually know is very legitimate. Um, the other thing is there are plenty of refugees leaving Ukraine, and, and I'm hoping that immigration-wise, we, you know, get more of them here in this country because they're hardworking, educated people, and they're going to contribute. Uh, so there are groups in the Bay Area that are sponsoring refugees. I just read about a group in Walnut Creek. Five mm -hmm. families basically sponsored one Ukrainian family. They take the kids to school. They taught the parents how to drive. They're making sure everybody learns English. They figure out, help them own, open a bank account uh, and navigate our culture. And, you know, I think helping the refugee family, you know, if you're not inclined to do the other things, you know, that might be a, a non-monetary way to have some skin in the game. I, I think we all have to have skin in the game. Uh, and we also have to make sure we don't get battle fatigue. You know, just, just because it's off the news for a day because there's something else crazy going on, uh, we can't forget what's going on. People are fighting for us and, and we have- Thank you, that, that's really validating. I'm a monthly giver to um, World Central Kitchen and um, it's good to know that they, you feel like that's a good one. Well, they've been great. Every everywhere I've been, like I said, Ukraine and other places, uh, you know, it, it, they're they're there and and they're you know they're pretty uh, they're pretty amazing. I, I just can't tell you how impressed I am with Chef Andres and, and his humanitarian reach. Thank you so much. Could you give the name again of the Walnut Creek Group? You know, I'd have to look it up and, and oh, okay. I'll try and find it. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, you know, one of the groups in the I'll area. Is bias. Yeah. Off the top of my head, it's not that specific group, but I can remember this one. HIAS is H-I-A-S, which is a Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. I know they're sponsoring refugees here, and, and I don't know about which group sponsored the five families. I'd have to look it up, but there's oh. more than one group here in the area. Okay, thank you. Great place to help. And Rick, do you have a question? Yeah, Admiral, um, just an amazing presentation. I've, I've taken your class and, and really always enjoy your presentations, but this, uh, this, was, this took the cake, as they say. Uh, admire your courage and your using your skills for, for a, an important purpose to help the Ukrainians. My question is, um, 
it seems like we've been kind of helping the Ukrainians somewhat slowly, and it seems like now now is the time to just give them what they need because there's no reason to hold back anymore. And when we see what Putin has in mind, he's not gonna he's not gonna stop. So it seems like we the whole world needs to just stop this man, and we need to give him advanced fighters, among other things. Yeah, you know, so I'm not in the logistics business too much, you know, and I don't sit at those planning sessions anymore. I know why they've been sort of tiptoeing into this uh, so as not to, you know, get, you know, blowback. Uh, but it's also not just blowback from the Russians, but it's blowback from the American public. You know, why are you sending 100 Bradley fighting vehicles to Ukraine? I mean, it takes time for people to get with it. It also takes time to train. So we may not have given some advanced systems to the Ukrainians yet, but I bet we're teaching their guys how to use them and the announcement will come like it did with the tanks. Um, and they need a lot more than tanks. Do they need fighters? Well, having thought about this for a while, there are other ways to do this, which is we can give our Abrams tanks to the other NATO countries like Czechoslovakia and Denmark and Germany, and they can give their old Soviet tanks, the T-72s, to the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians already know how to use them. By the same technique, we can give F-16 fighters to Poland and Czechoslovakia and Lithuania, and they can give their Russian MiGs to the Ukrainians, who already know how to use them. So yes, we need to give everything. I, I think we've been a little slow to react. I think we got caught flat-footed because everybody thought, everybody except Malcolm Nance thought they'd be defeated in a week. Um, and, you know, it was kind of a surprise. So, yes, I think we need to go all in. Uh, and the other thing I want to just mention to the group here, you know, if you get pushback from people about how we're spending money uh, on Ukraine, but not on Americans, let me explain something about how this really works. If we send 100 Bradley fighting vehicles or 20 Abrams tanks to Ukraine, we don't send the money to Ukraine. What we send the equipment, and then we take that money and we build replacements here. So if we got rid of 100 Bradleys and, and gave away 20 tanks, we have to rebuild those for our inventory. If we send them a, a boatload of ammunition for their artillery, we now have to put that money into our economy and get that stuff cranked out. You know, our economy has been kind of sleepy. We haven't had to build ammunition for a while. So, you know, there's a big ammunition plant in, in Scranton where Biden comes from. I hear they've really ramped up because uh, the demand is, is very high. Uh, so that money, a lot of it, some of it goes to Ukraine to buy things they need. But a lot of that money that you hear about the $40 billion, it goes back into our economy to build things, to make things. And, and so it's not really a giveaway. It actually comes back to us in, in a way, sort of a roundabout way, uh, by putting people to work, by having them uh, spend money in the economy by having them pay taxes. So, it, you know, it's kind of a win-win and I'm with you. We should give them everything they need and uh, we need to make sure that, that they survive. Thank you. Have a safe uh, journey to and from Ukraine. Thank you. I'll let you know where I wind up. I don't know where we're going yet because, you know, like I said, we're kind of travel in the dark till we get to where we're going. Right. Just safe. Be safe. Thank you. Uh, Charles Hottinger. Uh, yes, I'd like to know what your reaction would be to uh, a position I heard once uh, with some senior State Department or ex-State Department official saying, uh, we give Ukraine enough that they don't lose, but we don't give them enough that they win. Is, is that sort of the situation right now? <laughs> you know, that, I, I don't know where that statement came from or why, what his basis was. I think they have to win. I think the Russians have to leave Ukraine. I don't see the Ukrainians giving up an inch of anything. Um, there, you know, it, it would be very, it would be very painful for them. I mean, they've lost so many people and so many lives, and so many lives have been disrupted. I, I don't see them giving up anything. I think we need to go all in, and, and I think we need to get not only everybody else all in. We need to get some of those neutral countries off the sideline because they're just thinking about their own uh, best interests. You know, if they want a world order where we all have commerce and tourism and all those things, you know, we got to stop the war. But the only way to stop it is you can't give anything to the Russians. Putin has to be defeated. Yeah. So the only way to, for the Ukrainians to win is for Putin to be toppled. Exactly. And for the Russians to withdraw from Ukrainian territory. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should have done it in 2014. 
you know, but we hesitated. And, and that gave him license to do it again. And you know, if there's a negotiation and an armistice, he'll simply rearm, and he'll do it again. Yeah, um, I'm gonna jump to OG since Ellis, you've already asked a question. I'll come back to you, OG. Uh, yes, hi, this is Rick and OG's here. Um, okay. My question has to do with the nuclear threat. I think Putin is crazy. And I agree with everything you said, he has to be stopped, but I am very concerned about his apparent willingness to use tactical nuclear weapons. Would, do you have any thoughts about that? And if he, like, do you think he will? And what do we do if he does? Well, you know, in, in the military and in government, they work on contingency plans all the time, ahead of time, before a war breaks out. So I'll give you an example. Before, you know, we invaded uh, Iraq, two decades ago, you know, there was an operational plan for the invasion of Iraq. It had already been all laid out. Everybody knew exactly what to do. And the plan actually is quite detailed, right down to which airframes are going to fly what equipment and which battalions of troops. So I'm sure we have a contingency plan for that possible insanity. Uh, and, and they also have guys who are always trying to figure out his psyche. It's a little tough to know. Uh, you know, he doesn't have a lot of close confidants and doesn't give the kind of press conferences that, that we're used to. Um, so, you know, would he use them? He knows that would trigger a, a big response. And I'm hoping that's enough to make sure that he doesn't do it. Uh, and if he gets the itch to do something as his, you know, as his ship is sinking, he wants to do something crazy, maybe somebody would be smart enough to prevent him. Uh, we never know, but we can't let him blackmail us. Um, you know, we just, it's, it would be tragic to give up on Ukraine because Putin's threatening to use a nuke. He knows we will respond. NATO will respond. And also, I'll just point out, you know, I worked for Strategic Command for a year in Omaha under those 50 feet of concrete and behind the blast doors where they target nuclear missiles on other countries. The wind blows both ways. You know, you set off a nuke somewhere in Ukraine. You, you can't tell me that a lot of that um, radiation isn't going to wind up in Russia. So, you know, people, they share a common border. I don't remember the wind currents in that part of the world off the top of my head, but, you know, the wind does blow both ways. And uh, it would be crazy for the Russian people. It would be crazy for Putin. And we would respond. Yeah, that's true. Huh? I heard a funny comment um, where someone said, well, the oligarchs won't let Putin do nuclear because they don't want their homes in, in France and in Europe to be blessed. <laughs> okay. um, Ellis. Question. Well, thank you. Thank you for your response. Well, there are two areas that haven't been touched on. One is uh, China's uh, involvement in this whole thing. And the other thing is that we have been putting up with the bully in that it's okay for Putin to send missiles and so forth into Kiev and all of Ukraine, but it's not okay for uh, Zelensky to send missiles into Russian territory. And we're going to have to cross that border. That is, start hitting back. We've just been pushing back. When I say we, I'm talking about the Ukrainians, but they have not been hitting back in that they have not touched anything in Russian territory. And it seems that that's a verboten line. You can't hit the, the bully in the face. We have to be Marquita, whatever it is, Queensberry rules, and they're playing by, we're willing to kill babies. So that's a great question. Let me take that part first, because the other part, I'm not so much an expert. I'm not, I, I can say one thing about China. If they get involved, there will be a trade war between the US and China, and Walmart will collapse, and all our prices will go through the roof, and and their economy will be damaged more than ours because they're dependent on exporting to us, but we will be damaged by having to you know, go buy things, which is one of the reasons why Biden's smart enough to do the CHIPS Act and get us making our own chips just in case the Chinese turn off the supply from Taiwan. So that said, there's a lot of other things that we're vulnerable with, but um, as far as striking back, this is a really tough area. And, and I talked to some experts um, and, and I, I wanna give you a little view of history. Uh, Go back to uh, the Battle of Britain when the Germans were bombing London. Did it crush the resistance of the uh, British people? No, it, it made them strengthen their resolve. Uh, and and I'm, one of the concerns is 
is if missiles and bombs start striking targets in Russia, the Russians will say, yes, the Ukrainians are attacking us. It's true. And it will stiffen their resolve. Now, that said, there are some sneaky ways, uh, like when a bunch of airplanes blow up on one of their airfields, um, you know, that I, I think it's it's probably not such a bad thing. But I, there's a tremendous risk to actually shooting things into Russia. And that might be enough to just totally give Putin the license to, to do something even more crazy. I, I think what we're doing now, <laughs> Ukrainians to push them out of Russia and, you know, some of their special operations guys or their drones just happen to take out airplanes at Russian airfields. If I were going to shoot at anything in Russia, I would shoot at the places they're launching the drones and the missiles from. Uh, I wouldn't try, I, you got to be careful. You don't want to hit civilian stuff. Unlike the Russians who are very happy to hit civilian stuff. Uh, we got to have the moral high ground. So it's a great question. Uh, but remember, Russia's 140 plus million people, big military, lots of missiles, lots of airplanes. We probably don't want to get the Russian people all riled up. What we want to do is wear them down with the sanctions on their economy, uh, which I suspect they've noticed. But it's a great point. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I was going to ask. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. On that point, I had heard of uh, uh, airfields deep inside Russia being hit. You know, planes are blowing up on the ground. I don't know how is that how is that response to drones or whatever. But and the, so there is some proactive action there. And one thing uh, I would read that. Uh, Putin no longer travels by air within Russia. He travels in a heavily armored train. Are, are you? <laughs> is that really the case that he has to worry about? The, they don't have con complete air control over their airspace. Well, I I don't know. I, I only know what I read, and I don't know how accurate it is. Um, I, I suspect he's extremely cautious. Remember during COVID, you know, you couldn't get within fifty feet of him. So you know, he he's very. I don't even know if he lets his oligarchs and his buddies hang out with him. Um, so, you know, really hard to know. Um, I suspect he realizes he's at great risk because not only is he being criticized by uh, all the young people who didn't want to be conscripted and left Russia by the hundreds of thousands, right? Uh, something I'd never seen or imagined would happen. But, you know, he's being criticized by the right for not being uh, bad enough to the Ukrainians. I don't you know how much more bad is it they want him to do, but you know, he's taken it from both sides. And, uh, you know, well, yeah. unfortunately, since a lot of educated, talented, young Russian intelligentsia left Russia, you know, there aren't too many people in Russia to oppose him right now. Uh, so who knows what would really happen? You just never know. Yeah, well, there's been speculation that he has Parkinson's. At least that was a speculation of a few months ago. Well, you know, tomorrow <laughs> he's given us, you know, he might do the, the bareback, the bear shirt, a horseback ride or something, the judo match or something to impress us. You know, it's, it's really hard to get information out of Russia. He, he doesn't yeah. let you get too close. Uh, the flip side of that is, I can't tell you how I impressed I am with Joe Biden. He has way more energy than me. He jumps off that airplane, takes the 10-hour train ride, you know, tours all over, gives a speech, comes back to Poland, gives another speech. You know, it's already kind of pushing my bedtime here. I don't know how he does it, but he's pretty amazing. <laughs> Give the guy a lot of credit, uh, a credit for going there, credit for, you know, saying what we all want to say. And, you know, he was very gracious to the Poles who hosted him, um, you know, who taken in over a million refugees, which, yeah, Biden gets a lot of credit. I, I just, you know, I'm looking at him and I'm looking at Putin and I'm thinking, boy, are we lucky. Yes, I agree. Um, Linda Rybell. Linda, do you have a question? She's muted. Okay. Hi, Hi Michael. Um, Slava Biden. Yeah, Biden. Yeah, it's, it's, also, my I have a fantasy. This is not a question, but the, the oligarchs' yachts will be turned into hospitals and refugee centers. So I hope people around the world are impounding them. That's all. Well, well you know, you, you, I read what you read. So they, they've definitely had some of them snatched. 
Uh, but there's going to have to be a lot more done. You know, it's just there's something that the Treasury Department can do, which is countries trading with Russia can get hammered by U.S. sanctions. Uh, I think we need to lean on India and Brazil and South Africa and some of the guys who are, you know, kind of helping the Russians. If the, you know, if they buy Russian oil, it gives the Russians enough money to run the war. Um, and it takes a lot of money to run a war. So mm -hmm. let's, let's hope that we can, you know, keep up with what's going on. But yeah, I, I think that would be one small thing that we could do. Every little step helps, just like those kids. You know, everybody has to be in this fight. The kids are, are have to learn their skills so they can rebuild their country. I've never been so impressed with school kids. Middle school, you know, I had a couple. It's hard for me to picture them uh, given such great history. And in a second language, right? Um, pretty amazing kids. Like the kids will save them. Yeah. Help save us too. I had a, a question. Um, it seems like I've read that people are saying, well, can, the war can only end if it's negotiated. And, and I agree with you that we want to just end it, stop it. Um, who are the like people, journalists or congressmen or people that, that talk about that we need to just end the war and not don't do no negotiations? Who can we find to, to quote and to propagate their ideas? Well, let me, let me take it from a different perspective. Today at the United Nations, the Chinese representative we, you know, was trying to get everybody to talk about, you know, we should have an armistice and a negotiation. So who would be benefited from that? Well, of course, Russia would be benefited. Uh, by the same token, we have some politicians in this country who are suddenly pro-Russian, pro-authoritarianism. Used to be the Republican Party was very anti-Russian and pro-American security and patriotic. And something's happened. Uh, something weird has happened. Anyway, uh, I don't know who you can quote. I think we just all need to read more about it and talk to more people about it and listen to some of the experts. Um, there's a really, really good uh, columnist who writes here in the Bay Area named Anastasia Adele, E-D-E-L. She teaches these courses about Ukraine and Russia for, for Ali. She, she has a lot of insight into the history and the politics. Um, and there's other experts. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just, you know, as the guy says on Star Trek, you know, I'm just a doctor, Jim. Um, I'm not an expert on all these things, and uh, but I've learned a lot in my time, and I'm, I'm happy to go back and, and help them again. So, you know, that, that's really where my expertise is, but thanks for the question. And I heard that you're going back in March. Is that right? That's correct. You don't know where. I don't know where. Well, well, one thing you do is you, you're a really good doctor, and you're a really good speaker, and we appreciate you being here tonight. Um, it's been fascinating. It's been enlightening. Um, I, did, I learned a whole lot, and so thank you so much for well, your time. It's really my privilege just to bring this information to you guys. I feel like I have some insights. If you have other questions, send an email to Brody. She can forward it to me, and we can have a, a, a more of a conversation as time permits. Thank you okay. all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whew, that was just wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't think of any better than that. Yeah, um, I, I yeah I was it just it was amazing. Um, so I was wondering, um, I don't know who our speaker is going to be uh, next month. Or, or any does anybody have any comments or any suggestions for next month or any other things people need to be alert about? Activities, events. Are we all wiped out? <laughs> Say, so, Brody, this is Chuck Honiger. Uh, I'm on the speakers committee for a men's group of about of about 200 that meet uh, every month. And I'd love to be able to contact Dr. Baker to see if we could imp importune him to uh, appear in person in San Ramon sometime like this fall. So. Uh, oh, yeah. Once he gets so back. I, yeah. Okay. We'll have amazing stories to tell us. <clears throat> Would you like his contact information? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you can just email it to me, it would be fine. Yeah. But that, that, would, that, that would be a spectacular presentation. Yeah. If you could give it. Because... Well, thank you so much for being at this meeting and staying on for our, our, our two different speakers. I, mean, I I enjoy having both two speakers, but it's such a big great. choice for everyone together. Might as well have two great speakers. So um, they were. You for being for being here tonight thanks brody thanks brody thank you great job
Yeah, thank you. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you at one point. Oh, God. Emily.